So our theme for today is genetics, heredity, and human origins. So we learned at school that the cell is said to be the basic unit of life. And it has three parts, the cell membrane, the nucleus, and the cytoplasm. Or depending who you are talking to, it is said to have seven parts, um, which could be the nucleus, which is the headquarters, the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, the lysosomes, or the, the, the perisosomes, uh, the cytoskeleton, and the endoplasmic reticulum ER, and the Golgi apparatus and mitochondria. So when we were taught these, we were taught that this is the basic unit of life and the cell is, the nucleus, I'm sorry, is the headquarters. Um, the nucleus is in the middle of the cell and it contains um, all the cells chromosomes which encode the genetic material of the cell. Um, the central part of an atom um, comprises nearly all the atomic mass and it consists of protons and neutrons. By now you can see where I am going. You can see the direction that I'm taking with this lesson. Um, I'm slowly moving towards the complex from the simple while trying to build on the theme um, that we are focusing, us, focusing on today of um, genetics, uh, heredity, and human origins. The, the vertical conceptual progression is preferred in most cases where judgment is about to be made. Uh, and often the horizontal contextual alignment is sacrificed in the search for depth and weight of presentation. Now, today we are going to gravitate more to the latter. So the vertical is grounded on the horizontal. I recommend the Quest magazine for the contextualization of content. And if you look at my screen there on my far left is our latest publication. And we are focusing on networks and communication. We are moving from very simple stuff where you are talking about systems to talking about climate change uh, to talking about genetics, uh, to uh, talk about um, seismic surveys and the minimal, meaningful consultation of societies. And if you look at the one in the middle, we focused on magnetism. And this was more in the physics area, physical sciences area. And the current one, 18.1, is more on your life sciences area. This magazine is available both in print and in a digital format. And this is our website where you can go and get one for yourself. I mean, it's in PDF version. Um, this magazine helps to break the compartments and bring the alignment I was talking to uh, earlier where we move horizontally to align what we learn in the classroom to our everyday experience. This year, we join the world in celebrating the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development as organized by UNESCO and managed by the Academy of Science of South Africa on behalf of the Department of Science and Innovation nationally and in the region. Basic sciences, and also named pure or fundamental sciences, are concerned with increasing um, and providing fundamental understanding of natural phenomena. 
The celebration is meant to strengthen the understanding of the role of basic sciences towards the achievement of Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Goals. This morning, you are going to be listening to Professor Him Himla Sudial, who is the Executive Officer of the Academy of Science of South Africa. She is a research professor in human genetics at the University of Witwatersrand and was a principal medical scientist at the National Laboratory Services. She was awarded the National Order of Mapungubwe, bronze by President Megi in, in 2005 for her contribution in science research. Professor Sudial is a decorated scientist with several awards and recognition under her belt. There is so much we can say about her, but I know that we sent you her bio with the invitation and you saw that. Thank you so much. Now I give over to my boss, uh, Mrs. Susan Felsman, over to you. Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, most welcome then to our distinguished guest, uh, Professor Imla Sudiel. Um, as you rightly mentioned, Sipu, we are very fortunate this morning that we could actually call her ours. So we are very privileged to have such a, a distinct um, researcher as part of our team at the, uh, at the Academy of Science of South Africa. So my name is Susan Feltzman. Um, I am the director of the scholarly publishing program of which um, part of the science engagement um, activities falls under my program. So it was very interesting to actually watch how many registrations we have received this for this morning. So there were quite a bit, 296. Um, and they were mostly from curriculum advisors, heads of science at school level, teachers and schools. But we are so grateful for um, those who have joined us this morning. So I hope you're projecting this webinar in the classroom where you actually have learners um, attending this meeting and, and joining us and, and um, this wealth of knowledge we'll be sharing. I do feel it is my, um, my, my, my honor and also my, that, that I should, coming from the Academy of Science of South Africa, at least introduce us. So we are known as the Academy of Science of South Africa, in short, ASSIF. So we were inaugurated in 1996. We're still um, comparatively with other organizations um, in the science sector quite young. So what is our mandate? Um, our mandate of the Academy encompasses all fields of scientific inquiry. And that means that we're not only focusing on natural sciences, but we're also looking at um, humanities, social sciences, etc. the whole spread of um, scientific inquiry. And it also includes the full diversity of South Africa's distinguished scientists. I think that's very important. So ASAF is the official National Academy of the Science of South Africa and represents the country in the international community of other science academies worldwide. We are funded by the Department of Science and Innovation. But I think what is very interesting and just to contextualize our activities this morning, and I think that's very important, is um, in our five-year strategic plan, um, us have proposed to uh, operationalize its activities around six strategic objectives that are outcome and output driven. And just very shortly, so the, and it's very important to understand and to contextualize our work. Our outcome one is independent, authoritative and influential scientific advice. Outcome two is science engagement. And this is what we're doing this morning and experiencing it. Outcome three is mobilizing knowledge. Um, four is facilitating partnerships. And five is scholarly support. And of course, outcome six is supporting transformation um, in South Africa. So our main goal within the science engagement remit is that we um, want to deliver effective science engagement and communication at all stakeholder levels, of which, of course, um, teachers and um, learners um, is, is quite important to us alongside all the other publics that we can identify. So we want to promote public understanding and science and the and the value of the science, thereby also building on social cohesion. I'm extremely grateful, Tsepu, that you've highlighted sort of the role of the Quest magazine 
because I just wanted to highlight a couple of our activities under this particular program. So ASAP is involved in many um, science engagement activities, but what we're focusing, focusing about this morning is specifically with a particular lens through our Quest magazine. Um, also that we will have various um, webinars in this year. So this is a second one in a series of presentations. And what we try to do during these webinars is to try and focus on some critical issues and try and unpack them and just make them a bit more understandable. And one of these is, is the subject that we're dealing with this morning. So in the curriculum and assessment policy statement for grades 10 to 12 life sciences, um, it is it's organized according to four knowledge strands, as you know. So the first one is life at the molecular, cellular and tissue level, which um, Tsepo has um, started to demonstrate and explain quite eloquently. The life process in plants and animals, environmental studies, diversity, change and continuity. So it's actually on this fourth one that we want to focus this morning because we feel that it has not been unpacked. And sometimes angels fear to tread to where others are very confident to actually go. So we thought that it would be good just to unpack it a bit. And considering that we have Professor Sudial on our team, uh, we thought it was most appropriate for her in a field um, to start unpacking this, this very complex issue as such. So we'll be looking at genetics and heredity, which is a difficult topic for some learners to understand. But I think once you're confident with the terminology and the concepts, you might enjoy and master it quite successfully. So we hope that this webinar of this morning will actually contribute to your understanding of this very complex field. So Tsepo, with that, I close my opening remarks and I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan. Um, now for the star of the moment, uh, Professor Sudial, over to you. Good morning, uh, colleagues and all participants logged on to this webinar. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to be in the seat today talking about my life uh, work. I normally do these sorts of engagements for everybody else. And as I say, charity begins at home. So I'm very excited to be able to talk to you about um, uh, genetics and the way in which I have utilized genetics in my career uh, to ensure that I made uh, a career out of it and uh, would like to share some of that information with you. So as is typical, we have presentations, which when we try to find it, uh, just before starting a webinar, we sometimes miss it. Is, there, is it coming through clearly now? It's visible, Prof. Excellent, wonderful. So uh, thanks, Seppo, for those kind words and Susan for introducing the Academy of Science of South Africa. Uh, I just very quickly want to share with you some of my formative years. Uh, I started off uh, in the Department of Human Genetics, which was then the South African Institute for Medical Research that was affiliated with Wits University, having done a master's in biotechnology. And I then completed a PhD with uh, Professor Trevor Jenkins, who was uh, very much involved in uh, starting, you know, the genetics, uh, one of the the themes of genetics in the country. And as a medical doctor, uh, also started genetic counseling and much later, the Steve Biko Ethics Center at WITS. So throughout my training, I have been introduced to science, to ethics uh, and the, the societal value of science. And uh, I was fortunate that I managed to take my PhD work Further, with an eminent scientist by the name of Mark Stoneking, who was at Penn State University uh, in the US. Um, and um, with my work conducted on the, the genetics using mitochondrial DNA uh, among the people of Southern Africa, I was able to work with Mark Stoneking, and you'll see why he's eminent in a little while. 
but uh, starting with Prof. Jennifer Thompson, who was my master's supervisor when I did uh, the biotechnology, I also come with a reasonably good pedigree, uh, being grounded by eminent scientists who have served as mentors, uh, um, you know, uh, colleagues that I could share knowledge with and learn from. And I think that's a very, very important uh, benefit when we consider where we come from in the genesis of uh, the sciences that shape us. And uh, armed with uh, these academic backgrounds, my professional life following the postdoc and returning to South Africa, uh, I was awarded an MRC unit and several other um, accolades that enhanced my visibility in the science. And it was very quick that these intersections with science for society came to the fore. Doing uh, population genetics took me out in the field, engaging with uh, you know, people in the scientific community, as well as uh, ordinary citizens who served as participants of my study. So to be able to take science out of the, of the university silos to the coalface of society was one of the most endearing um, privileges I have had in my uh, career spanning over three decades in this field. And in my latter years, having served on the council for the Academy of Science for South Africa, um, I had learned how to kind of contextualize this bandwidth of the engagement of science, the communication of science, and making science relevant to society. So it is with this sort of background that I, I have taken on the challenge of being the executive officer of the academy. And as you heard from both Seppo and Susan, I am very passionate about engaging science with, with all sectors of our society so that uh, science can become sexy. Students may want to you know, listen to this buzz and want to emulate what other mentors and, and people who are successful have done, but at the same time to bring out their passion for the way in which they can use science for their advancement of their own careers and for that of society. So, you know, the topic of genetics and heredity, you know, uh, started off before we even understood this terminology. And I think it would take me three lectures just to go into the historical perspective. But rather, I'm going to utilize the time to just give you snapshots so that uh, if you feel at a later stage you would like a little bit more, then you can talk to Seppo and we could schedule some things. So Seppo has talked about the cell and where the DNA is located. But we are very, very grateful that the young Jim, Wat Jim Watson in 1953, together with Francis uh, Crick, elucidated the structure of the DNA molecule. And um, you know, ever since then, although we had known about some heritable component that was transmitted from parents to offspring, et cetera, uh, how this all came together and the functioning was still out there for scientists to try to elucidate. And Watson and Crick, um, we're able to, to find how this all worked. And uh, so we are very grateful uh, that their contribution to the sciences, and there've been many, many, many awesome contributions as the field of genetics uh, together with heredity have come to the fore that we should be grateful for. Today, we just take things for granted because we don't question the genesis and the origins of things or where did, where could this concept have come from, et cetera? So it is very important for us to put all of these into perspective, to understand how things work. Would, uh, would, would that principles of understanding, we can bring together information in a much better way. And why I'm using my cap as a scientist for this, that protocol should be utilized for many, many things that we feel passionate about. And uh, in 2000, I was privileged to, uh, together with Professor Trevor Jenkins, to host Jim Watson in South Africa. Having heard me speak at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory where Jim Watson was one of the directors, 
Um, he had written to Professor, the late Professor Philip Tobias, asking him to arrange a trip for him and his wife to come to South Africa to, uh, to meet his um, ancestors. Um, I had talked at what at uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories in New York a few on a few occasions, and he would listen earnestly to this. But he was very interested in the story of the origins as related to Khoi and San peoples in Southern Africa. Trevor Jenkins then organized a few trips for him, one of which involved him camping for the first time with Tony Trail at one of the sites that Tony Trail, a linguist who was at Wits University, was studying one of the uh, click languages. And uh, for my um, contribution to hosting, I have inherited Jim Watson's tents and sleeping bag. And there's a funny occasion where we were out at uh, Game Pass going for a hike to look at some rock art paintings. And it was in April as the date would, would show at the bottom. And the river we had to cross was quite high at the closest point to this hillock that we had to climb. And so we meandered a little bit around the river finding a spot and the colleagues who were with us from archaeology helped us by standing with their deep boots uh, in the water and asked us to step on their shoes to cross the river. But Jim Watson, on the other hand, uh, you know, didn't want to do this. He thought he had long legs, he'll jump over. And there was Jim Watson taking not a running start, but trying to jump across this river. And he slipped on the bank on the other side. And as he slipped, he tore his pants. And uh, here we were, like, you know, a little bit embarrassed that the most famous, one of the most famous scientists fell in our company, tore his pants, and then had to walk the rest of the hike uh, with that uh, sort of embarrassment. But in any event, uh, the, it was a very successful opportunity to host him. We celebrated his 73rd birthday in the Drakensberg, and he really, really enjoyed that experience. So, so I have been fortunate that through, throughout my career, uh, I have managed to meet some seminal and awesome, awesome scientists who have contributed in shaping my thinking and who I am as I developed as a scientist on my own. But now, instead of just talking about the thrills and privileges of the sciences, I want to talk about genetics. Um, and, and pardon the fact that, you know, there's so much of terminology, I will try to strip off the jargon. But essentially, I want to emphasize that genetics is a relatively new branch of biology that is concerned with the study of genes, genetic variation, and heredity in organisms. And we owe a lot to the work of uh, Gregor Mendel, who did his work, uh, you know, crossing peas, some smooth peas and crinkle peas. And uh, Gregor uh, Mendel uh, worked at a monastery, he didn't have too much of scientific background, etc. He was an ordinary person, a monk. And uh, from his experimentation, um, we learned about uh, the trait inheritance, patterns in which traits, uh, features, in other words, can be handed down from parents to offspring over time. While he worked with uh, peas, uh, the variation of smooth peas and what they call crinkle peas, uh, he worked out the, the math in which all of these uh, features or traits were passed from one generation to the next. And so we owe a lot to him for his endeavors as well. And then building up on this, as uh, the technology started to come into the fore from the late 60s, early 70s, and were well established internationally by the 80s, uh, it became possible to, to manipulate genetic material to learn a lot more about them. And so I was privileged that when I joined WITS in 1986 as a master's student in biotechnology, I was one of the first 20 trained biotechnologists in the country and learned from the likes of uh, Jenny Thompson and others who taught us, uh, bringing together the application of this new toolkit of what was called uh, DNA 
uh, markers and so on. So we had a shift from what was called classical DNA markers or genetic markers that involved blood groups and, and blood proteins. Uh, so you, we all you know, learn about what blood groups we are, or whether we're universal donors or recipients and, and uh, our rhesus factors, uh, particularly at times of pregnancy. So we had this shift from what was being conducted in Trevor Jenkins' lab when um, the likes of a few of us armed with DNA technology joined the lab. And so uh, we then uh, started to embrace this uh, DNA technology uh, explosion that was happening elsewhere in the world. And remember the late eighties was still during the time when we were subjected to academic boycotts. So it wasn't easy for scientists to have access to tools and technologies and textbooks and analytical programs, et cetera, to be able to stand you know, shoulder to shoulder with international scientists. So a lot of this was learned and we had to practice and find information and get consumables via, via all kinds of routes to be able to do what we did from the late 80s into the early 1990s. And uh, one of the fields that seems to have, have grown from this context is population genetics. And that is what I uh, did a lot of my work on. And I will share how some of that is implicated in the title that we are discussing today. So uh, I'm not going to delve too much more in terms of uh, the location of DNA in the cell. Seppo has, has shared with us that our genetic complement resides in two structures in the cell, the nucleus and the mitochondrion. I will show you how this DNA is inherited differently in the nuclear DNA for each chromosome of which we have 46. We get one from mom and one from dad. That's the pairing that gives us what we call the diploid state. And as you know, the entire human genome was sequenced in, in the mid uh, 1990s. It's made up of about 3 billion individual building blocks called nucleotides. And uh, compared to that, in addition, the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse that makes energy in the cell over evolutionary processes, retained the relic of DNA from some prokaryote or bacterial organisms that now has a very small size of about 16,500 of these building blocks or nucleotides. So we as humans have 46 chromosomes. Um, the 22 pairs are what we call the autosomes. So chromosomes one to 22 are autosomes but we have a pair of sex chromosomes. Now the karyotype, which is the arrangement of all these chromosomes, which the cytogeneticists do for a whole lot of other sorts of studies, they look at the chromosome numbers. So for example, three copies of chromosome number 21, they will call as a, a trisomy 21 that's linked with Down syndrome. Now, this karyotype that has one copy of an X chromosome and one of a Y is that of a male. A female will have two copies of the X chromosome. Now, don't confuse the sex chromosomes with mitochondrial DNA, because I will show you that whereas the nuclear DNA is inherited one copy from each parent, the mitochondrial DNA is almost exclusively transmitted from mothers to both her sons and daughters, and only daughters will pass it on. The value of that mode of inheritance is important, as you will see later when I talk about its value in population genetics. So colleagues, we, we, we now understand where the genetic information resides in the cell. We know that we have two genetic components, nuclear DNA made up of the chromosomes, and mitochondrial DNA, which is in the outside the nucleus or extracellular in this powerful structure that allows us to make energy, to provide all the energy to drive all the processes 
in our bodies. Now, this is just a very quick summary of genetic herit inheritance. And uh, if we start at the layer of the great grandparents where everything is like a similar color, you will notice as you pass DNA from great grandparents to, to grandparents, to parents, to the point at which it gets to us, some of the chromosomes undergo changes of colors due to meiotic events of exchanging of chromosomal bits of information. So while the schematic shows something like solid bars of a single color suggesting that it was unmixed, we in our genetic information are a mixture of various bits of information that has passed down over the generations to us. That's where our chromosomal DNA. The circles in these uh, schematic represents the mitochondrial DNA. And I'm not sure if you could see it clearly, but these individuals in this generation have the solid dark pink, which is only associated with the mother's line from mother to great grandmother and great great grandmother on the mother's line. That will become apparent in another slide. And only male individuals have the shorter version of the stick, which is called the Y chromosome. So in, in um, modern genetics, it is very important for us to understand the modality of inheritance, because in the diagnostic situation, some diseases have a much more pronouncement. For example, X-linked uh, diseases will be much more important, like uh, in some instances, if it is coming through the mother, because the father will only contribute a Y chromosome to the son. So it's important when analyzing the children for us to understand the modality of inheritance. Now, how do we get these changes? Changes come about you know, sometimes purely by chance. And by the time they reach a particular, what we call threshold or frequency, they pass down generationally. So the study of evolution is actually being able to track changes across time to some point back in the past. And given that Y chromosomes and mitochondrial DNA are inherited only through a single line lineage, it is important for us to be able to understand how they become useful in scenarios that I will be talking about. But I'll get to that also a bit later. I just want to share with you the, a picture of Gregor Mendel. Uh, I was trying to find a picture to share with you in 2014. My brother and I visited Brno and went to the monastery it was an, just an amazing experience to be able to, to be in that space where, you know, these original experiments were conducted, et cetera. But unfortunately, I couldn't find the pictures because I was trying to find it late at night. And my brother was too busy to help me find it on his Facebook. But nonetheless, it was one of those hair-raising moments to be at Brno, to look at uh, the place where um, Mendel worked, and, and they still have some pictures in the gardens showing the crosses that gave rise to some of his um, work that we have come to understand as Mendelian inheritance. So what are some of the features of uh, Mendelian inheritance? A uh, uh, Mendelian trait or feature is caused by a single gene. Now, why I'm emphasizing the single because diseases like diabetes, uh, hypertension, and you know, some mental diseases, et cetera, if genes are implicated, they're very, very complex. More than one gene contributes to it. And not everything is genetic. We, as biological entities, respond to the environment as well. So this intricate, complex engagement between the genetic or the biological and the environment is also very important when studying complex disease traits like diabetes, for example. Now, uh, it is also important to note that the mode of inheritance re reveals whether the Mendelian trait is either dominant or recessive, and whether the gene that controls it is on an autosome or a sex chromosome. 
So for example, my colleagues in, in human genetics uh, that offer genetic services coupled with genetic counseling will first, when they meet with uh, uh, subjects, uh, take out a pad and a pen and they will ask them questions about their family tree. You know, like who in the family would have had a particular disease, et cetera. So before they do any genetic work, they will look at how the disease trait runs in that family. And then with knowledge about what the disease may be uh, by either looking it up or just knowing it intuitively as a consequence of their experience, they will then determine uh, whether it's a dominant, a recessive, or is it an, an autosome, namely chromosomes 1 to 21, uh, 22, sorry, or on the sex chromosomes. So from that uh, Mendelian inheritance, uh, we can categorize a genetic uh, a single gene disorders in five categories, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked dominant, X-linked recessive, and Y-linked. Now, this may sound overwhelming to those of you who are, are not trained in biology, but it's, it's simply uh, going and looking up Mendelian inheritance and trying to understand it. But of course, I have put in a few examples. So let's, for one, look at an autosomal dominant inherited, inheritance. So when I say autosomal, it does not involve the sex chromosome. Dominant meaning that one of the factors or alleles is dominant in this particular disease. And in this little pedigree or family tree, the dominant transmitting uh, chromosome is indicated by a capital D and the recessive one by a small d. Now, dad has one copy of a dominant and one copy of a recessive. So we would say that he, he, he is heterozygote for this particular feature. Mum, on the other hand, has two copies of the recessive trait. Now, if we were to cross this, let's say they were to have a baby. And in one scenario, dad, chromosome that went into the baby for that trait carried the dominant or the big D, the small D can, mom can only give a small D. So if mom gives a small D, this, and if this was a son, uh, then that child would be affected. Why? Because it has a copy of the dominant allele. So dominant, you know, as the name suggests colloquially, uh, presides over uh, everything else. On the other hand, if dad gave the recessive allele, remember mom can only give a recessive. I, both her chromosomes have the small d's. So in this instant in the case, and, and I'm just showing you this as a, as, a, as a daughter, this child has two copies of the recessive. So there's no dominant factor. So she'd be normal. Similarly, if we go to another child and every pregnancy, it's a chance which chromosome is donated by dad carried in his sperm and by mom carried in an egg, you're going to get a, a big D in the case of this cross and only small D for mom, so that's affected. So in this instance, the autosomal, because it's on a, an autosome can, give you uh, one case where you have an unaffected, two cases with um, normal and another scenario with affected. So affected is 50% and unaffected 50%. So you need to look at those options to be able to confer how that transmission of probability is going to come through. So one example for this particular trait is Huntington's disease. Now, the colleagues in my department who study Huntington's disease will know that this is a late onset disease. And that when you do diagnosis with this, 
you require the input of the genetic counselors because you've got to consider the, uh, the state of mind of individuals who will, who, if they've had an affected parent, will know that they've got a 50% chance of being infect, uh, affected, not infected, affected. So there's a lot more genetic counseling that is required in this instance. With respect to an autosomal recessive, and let's now consider the case where both parents are carriers. In this case, the, the, the one on which the disease chromosome is transmitted, we call the big R, and the recessive, the small R. Uh, again, you got 50% chance of bringing a carrier, you got a 25% chance of a normal offspring and a 25% chance of an affected. So in the case where you have uh, both the, um, the, 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 the parents who are carriers, the probability for normal is one in four. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much of detail with the terminology of genotype and phenotypes, but all I want to say is what we are looking at here in these uh, um, capital R's and so on are the genotypic, what is in the genomes of the ratio, but what you see, the clinical manifestation are the phenotypes. So hopefully, that concept is something you are familiar with as well. Okay, so I just want to shift gears a little bit and move away from the chromosomes to my sexy molecules, which are mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA. As this schematic shows that in the previous scenario where I showed you all the, the individuals in the three or four generations that we looked at, Mitochondrial DNA is transmitted exclusively on the mother's side and, in, and passed on to both sons and daughters, but only daughters will pass it on. The other feature of this transmission is unlike with chromosomal DNA, this DNA does not undergo that reshuffling or mixing of genetic elements, meaning recombination does not happen. So in the absence of recombination, together with this uniparental or a single parent mode of transmission, mitochondrial DNA was one of the tools of choice to look at population affinities from the latter 1980s uh, to the present. Similarly, if we talk about the Y chromosomes, in the same way mitochondria is passed from mothers to uh, all children, but only through the daughters. Fathers only transmit their Y chromosome to their sons. So why, whereas both parents give us all our autosomal related DNA, when it concerns mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome, it's passed on through a single parent. That's very important. And coupled with that are some mathematical rules that we use to detect uh, what we call uh, population size or effective population size. But I don't want to complicate the issue just so that you understand that nuclear DNA is transmitted by both parents to all offspring, um, whereas mitochondria and Y chromosome are transmitted through a single parent and only retained in a particular sort of way. So with that, I now want to move on to my next topic for discussion, and that concerns human origins. So using mitochondria and Y chromosome DNA as my toolkit, I ventured into research looking first at the history of peoples that lived in Southern Africa, and when our borders became open for us doing research elsewhere on the continent, I was able through collaborations with scientists elsewhere on the continent to be able to, to, to examine populations uh, outside of Southern Africa within the Sub-Saharan African region. And I'd like to share this schematic drawn by Professor Ken Kidd, who uh, is a seasoned scientist at Yale University. And, he, and, and I call this the smarty box 
way of understanding the spread of uh, humans out of Africa. So if you had a smarty box and you shook it, in Africa, we will have all colors of the smarties in that box. But out of that box, only a few predominantly yellow and blue smarties came out of that box to give rise to the genetic patterns of variation elsewhere in the world. Now, I hope that image sticks in your brain because now let's look at some of the complexities of how we unpack that using genetic tools as a means to reconstruct the history of the peoples of the world. So how is it that human populations have come to spread out of Africa to, to be present throughout the globe? People move for no reason other than perhaps to find better food resources. Uh, maybe there was an element of excitement to see, well, what is beyond where I am? But essentially, if you study some of the implications of why people have moved uh, from one place to the other, it's pri prim primarily about their survival. Where could they have opportunities for better resources? And of course, we should also contend that perhaps the curiosity-driven element is also there. So in modern visualization of the populations of the world, we can find humans basically throughout the world. And using various types of genetic markers, <coughs> the roots of migration have been studied. And it's not exclusively genetic methodologies. Let's, for example, look at the African continent. This is a schematic summarized by the use of linguistic and archeological information. Every line is a suggested route of migration that some of our early ancestors adopted within Africa and outside of Africa. And there's a very good correlation between uh, the different toolkits. Obviously, also taking into consideration some of the limitations. So for example, a, a genetic tool could take you to 150 to 200,000 years. Archeology, span depending on the type of information you're using, using Iron Age technology, uh, if you're using agriculture, you will have different sorts of timeframes into the past. Uh, and lang languages, you know, as a tool is probably best resolved to between eight and 12,000 years before the present. So it's very important for us to be using the right toolkit to answer specific questions. However, if we are trying to understand the history of our own species, it's only one history. So at some point, understanding that there may be some limitations with the particular toolkit, we should be able to draw on the expertise that each discipline brings together. And very soon, a nice puzzle will come together to give us a clearer and better picture. And that's what I have tried to do with my genetic toolkit. And as uh, some of my uh, archeological colleagues who are on the line would tell, from a very early age in my professional career, I've been engaging with archeologists, linguists, historians, and paleontologists to try to understand their world and to share with them my world so that we learn from each other. So it's very important to be multidisciplinary in the approaches to try to uncover what we want to know about the past. So I summarize it here is what you seek determines what you find. And you also can say, if you have a question about what did humans eat 10,000 years ago, genetics is not gonna give you that answer. But archeology span may, because archeologists look at settlement patterns and they look for tools that these humans who occupied such sites would have used. Did they use pottery? What did they eat? Did they have bovine shelf shells or whatever the case is? You will learn through all of it. But taking all or some of these uh, kind of uh, sub-disciplines together helps in building the questions we ask. 
And I'm sharing with you here some pictures of uh, Professor Trevor Jenkins, who was my mentor. One of my former students, uh, Karina Schlibusch, is now a professor in, uh, in, in Sweden, and we continue to collaborate. Some other field work that I've done in, in the Northern Cape uh, with Professor Mike de Jong. We also had genetic nurses assisting us when we collected samples. And we go into rural areas sometimes to collect samples so that we, we, we can have access to the communities whose genomes we want to study. And one of my first accolades is editing a book on the prehistory of Africa, which is in my opinion, one of the first sources of bringing together in this multidisciplinary way, uh, understanding how the different tools that have been used to reconstruct the prehistory of Africa have come together. And we still need to work on this uh, to bring in the newer genetic uh, tools to tell a fuller story. So using genetic records from the past, uh, what can we learn from it? We can understand how we are related to other species. We can learn about the origin and migrations of our early ancestors. We can look at uh, historical migrations that have been inferred. So for example, uh, early scientists, uh, early uh, culture in Africa where bananas were not indigenous came from the East. How do we know that? Because people who were you know, uh, uh, trading in the wider Indian Ocean Rim brought uh, artifacts, glass beads from China, banana, et cetera, from other Indonesian countries to Africa. Chickens came from outside. And then, you know, we, we learn from these disciplines. And then you could say, well, if that was the case, did the people who brought these leave their genes on the African continent? So we can then test for those because people around the globe show some differences in their genetic patterns. And so while I focused on studying uh, the genetics of people from Africa, it was always done in a comparative way with populations found elsewhere. He could also use uh, genetic information for parentage testing, uh, more commonly paternity testing, but every so often uh, some throwbacks come in where in fact there's a non-maternity inferred. Uh, some of you may be aware that there've been a few cases in our media about babies being swapped in hospitals. So my colleagues in the department who do parentage testing may be asked by the courts to, to look at this and how they go about doing it. Forensic applications, uh, those of you who watch all the forensic programs on TV, where they, they so quickly come with an outcome, takes work about individual identification, et cetera. So these are some of the utility of uh, genetic markers. And we, we take advantage of the differences in genetic markers found across or across uh, populations or individuals to be able to bring out the essence of what it is we're trying to do. So all of this work that I will talk about that I have engaged with has come from years of conducting field work and communica uh, community engagement. And prior to 1992, when I did work in Trevor Jenkins lab, the furthest trip I made was to the departmental freezers to pull out blood specimens and to extract the DNA for the work. And it was only in 1992 uh, that Professor Michelle Ramsey, who is now at WIT still, together with a few other colleagues, uh, working with Commandant Van Veik at, uh, at Schmidtstrift, where some may recall where the tented facilities where the two groups of San Nequa and Nujun were, were residing. And these are people who were moved from the Omega base at the border of Angola and Namibia between the, prior to the Namibia gaining independence. And, and those communities had some people that were used by the South African def uh, Defense Force at the time, uh, using sun for the tracking expertise. So when Namibia got independence, what do they do with these individuals? So they moved them to Schmidtstrift 
And that is where I uh, had an opportunity to, to study these communities. And now I want to throw an ethical question. Even though we got their informed consent for collection of blood samples to conduct the test, do individuals who are in a military context have the freedom of choice? And that question plagued me for a number of years because, I mean, I saw, I mean, we, we conducted ourselves in a professional way, but we worked with a commandant, Commandant Van Veik, who in Afrikaans addressed the groups and asked them to line up to come forward for participation. So I was a little bit unnervy about uh, the ethics there. And I wrote about this in a book chapter. Excuse me, I just need a drink of water. And so I just want to say such scenarios manifest even today with some ethical issues re regarding consent. And consent is not just um, you know, getting permission. It must be informed consent. Do you disclose to your subjects, no matter what research you're doing, what the pros and cons of the research are? And I'm currently writing a paper on some ethical issues and the consent issue is very, very important. Now, people feel, or some commentators in science feel, well, why should you go, why should 20 researchers go into the field and collect samples from uh, communities? Why can't we get broad consent? And when I, like a scientist, have the samples, my ethics committee should allow me to share it with all and sundry. Unfortunately, the queer and the Sun people do not like uh, a broad consent because they feel if Himla Sudia comes to the front door, why should other scientists piggyback and take her samples and her data and do things? So it's it's a it's a complex issue and not one you know cap fits all. The other thing we should be cognizant of is what is the benefit for communities. So another concept in ethics called benefit sharing has come into play. So since we ask communities to participate in our studies, what do we give them as a benefit? And in our own research, we have always gone back uh, into the field and shared some of the genetic results or the ancestry results that we got. Is we believed that um, allowing people to understand how their, their contributions assisted us in writing papers, what it meant to them. So we firmly believe that understanding one's history and one's past is, is very constructive in the way we deal as communities in thinking about our culture, our, our heritage, and what we can do with that collectively for the future. So I told you earlier, I'm gonna talk again to you about Mark Stone King that I did my postdoc with. In 1987, actually on the 1st January, 1987, and Rebecca Kahn, Mark Stone King, and the late Alan Wilson produced a seminal paper that, that brought this new age of understanding of our origins uh, into focus. They called uh, their study on mitochondrial DNA and human evolution as being able to postulate that humans originated in Africa. From this spun the out of Africa theory concerning our human evolution. And this was based on the methodology of analysis that they used at the time by showing that the first branch in the human mitochondrial DNA tree, which is shown here like a horseshoe, contained DNA exclusively from peoples on the African continent. And then the rest of the world's DNA fell on other branches. So they used a particular way of analyzing DNA called a midpoint uh, phylogenetic method, but don't worry about it, but just take it for granted that the analytical tool that they use to give some evolutionary trajectory to understanding how humans evolved uh, indicated that Africa was the homeland for the most ancient and most diverse mitochondrial genetic elements. Uh, and so came the out of Africa theory. There have been lots of debate and contestations about it. 
And as the science developed from using the methodology that they did for their study to the more recent ones, it is now unquestioned. And this is based on much, much more um, refined whole mitochondrial genome sequencing data. And once again, we see that the deepest branches in the tree not only come from Africa, but from people who currently will be referred to as queer, Koi and San. And this tiny branch of the human mitochondrial tree is what we see elsewhere in the world. So for the vast majority, this lightish blue and this, this purple is what we see in Africa. And only this dark pink is what is seen outside of Africa. So this whole mitochondrial genome re-emphasized what was seen earlier by Ken Stone King and Wilson, that in fact, the out of Africa theory was still supported with mitochondrial DNA. And as the new genetics of whole genome sequencing and other genetic methodologies have been introduced, the out of the Africa theory is still predominantly supported. So coming back to some uh, seminal studies, uh, some of you may remember that in 2010, the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu donated his samples for whole genome. This is sequencing the entire 3 billion nucleotides of information in his DNA. And four individuals of San origin from Namibia were also sequenced. And this study, uh, published by some scholars from Penn State and others, showed quite convincingly yet again that whole genome sequencing information, which is from both parents, uh, showed again what mitochondrial DNA was showing from a long, long time, that Africa seems to be the region from whence our ancestry has evolved. Um, I'm just showing for a bit of a commercial break, uh, going to, Penn, uh, to Cold Spring Harbor. This is Professor Tobias, uh, Jeff Blundell, the archaeologist, uh, Tony Trail, Trevor Jenkins, and my colleague Bharti Marar and I, who were doing the genetic work, um, who were hosted by uh, Jim Watson at Cold Spring Harbor, to be able to talk about his, the work that he saw uh, when he had visited uh, South Africa the year before. Now, subsequent to uh, the Schuster articles, etc., together with my former postdoc, uh, Karina Schliebusch, and, and colleagues, uh, Matthias Jacobson and Pontus Schuglund, we showed, again, the antiquity of early humans being in Southern Africa, found almost exclusively in the San and Koi. So again, when we looked at how old peoples in Africa are, the first branch, these, the, the two branches on the right-hand side are almost exclusively San and Koi. And only when you come to the shallower branches of the tree are there representations of individuals from elsewhere on the African continent. And the point at which we can converge some of these genetic elements are in excess of 200,000 years ago. And I see Lynn Wadley on the line, uh, and she's been working at Florespud. And so this is the kind of dating of the Florespud skull. So there's a little bit of overlap between what the genetic story is saying and some of the skeletal remains as uh, brought out by archeologists and paleontologists. So in the last few minutes, colleagues, I know I'm going a little bit into the time. I just want to touch on what happened when some of our ancestors left Africa and explored the rest of the world. They came into contact with some of the Neanderthals and other archaic specimens who lived out there. The question is, did they exchange genes with uh, Neanderthals? And when mitochondrial DNA was used, we did not see any indication of this exchange. So for a long time, the mitochondrial DNA suggested, no, there was no exchange. But we had very few samples from Neanderthals at the time. And one of the people who, who, who was challenging this topic was, um, uh, uh, what's his name now? I'm forgetting his name, Savante Paubo. 
Savante Pavo was also uh, one of the people from the uh, Alan Wilson lab, lab at Berkeley. And um, uh, in his early days, uh, he was able to get DNA out of an 8,000 year old mummy. So he had expertise looking at what we call ancient DNA work. So now that he is in Germany, um, they got DNA from the type specimen. The type specimen is the specimen after which a fossil is named. So for example, Neanderthals are named from the, the specimen that was first discovered in the Neander Valley in Germany. And so using the Neanderthal sample and a few other samples elsewhere uh, in Europe, uh, they concluded that Neanderthals in fact exchange some genes with modern humans. And uh, at the early time, this exchange seemed to have happened outside of Africa. So peoples from Europe and Asia all the way into Australasia seem to have between one and 4% of Neanderthal genes in their genome. More recently, because of backflow of, of, of elements of genes from Europe and Asia into Africa, some of this has been seen, but not in the ancient African specimens. So did modern humans admix with uh, Neanderthals? The answer is a resounding yes. There have been other studies, for example, some specimens from a cave in Russia. Uh, it's called the Denisova cave. And, and similarly, there seems to be exchange from these other archaic forms with modern humans. So colleagues, essentially we are all Africans under the skin. We may look different, but when you study the genetics of the peoples of the world, it does show a resounding emphasis of bringing us back to Africa being the, the, the geographic region from whence our origins stem. And one of the things that I've been privileged to do together with my colleagues in the Department of Human Genetics is to offer genetic ancestry testing to the community at large. And this is again a schematic of the mitochondrial DNA tree, the complex one I showed you side by side with the Ken Stonking and Wilson horseshoes uh, model. And, and as we would see that there are different branches on this tree, but the common trunk is deeply rooted in Africa. All the green red circles from the L nomenclature are the ones that originated in Africa. And as the diversity tapers when you go outside of the world, uh, less genetic variation in even mitochondrial genomes are found in outside of Africa. So when we did ancestry testing, taking a sample from a cheek swab and trying to trace mitochondrial DNA in both males and females, and Y chromosomes only in males, we'd give them a summary of which branch in the mitochondrial tree their DNA could be found, and a little bit history about how that DNA migrated to that particular area. I was privileged also for a documentary we did for Pat Blanche in 2004 to have sampled many celebrities and, and, and uh, people well known in the community, one of whom was the late uh, President Nelson Mandela. And that was a very exciting experience to be able to give him his DNA results. His on his mitochondrial line had a branch that was commonly found in Koi and San uh, descendants. And he was very excited and he made a joke about his ancestry uh, being um, linked with uh, on his mother's side to Koi and San. Uh, other people have tried to do similar sorts of reconstructions and how we relate uh, genealogies or our family tree, tree into reconstructing the past. I mean, Charles Darwin's uh, great, great, great grandson, Chris Darwin provided a sample that was used to eventually uh, figure out what Charles Darwin's Y chromosome would be. So for those of you on the line who, who teach about genealogies and family tree, there's ways of linking genealogies to people who are not living today, but to make inferences 
about some aspects of their uh, genetic heritage. And in the case of Charles Darwin, his Y chromosome was recognized as belonging to, um, again, using some jargon terminology, but a branch of the Y chromosome tree that's re re referred to as R1B. And that's how R1B came about to be or to originate coming out of Africa originally through Europe and Asia as a Eurasian branch and then seeding it in Europe. Lastly, colleagues, I just wanna to say to you that uh, my journey of being able to take some of the science into the, to the population at large uh, involved the use of genetic ancestry testing and uh, we created a suite of uh, cartoons uh, uh, to, to support storytelling, to be able to communicate the complexities of the science in easy to follow ways by telling stories. And we entitle these uh, um, uh, kind of comic strips, the roots to roots uh, with the emphasis on the, ex the meaning of the two. And I was privileged to work with Jive Media from Peter Marisberg to develop these tools. And here we're now telling a story uh, where a family sitting is talking about how the Gogo came to be where she is staying. And there's some members of the family who have been exposed to science. And then they talk about these alternate ways, meaning the genetic testing. And then we produce some tools to explain how you get from a, a sample taken as a cheek swab to the actual uh, genetic bits of information and the sorts of analysis that goes into it till we in fact bring out the, the answer that we want. And colleagues, this is what we call taking science into society, but it's not only about ancestry testing. Very often we got to balance the good, the bad and the ugly to be able to, to emphasize uh, among communities uh, the, the broader concept of societal value of science. Uh, and you know, we, we often ask to consider various issues in politics. Should politics and science mix? Uh, who has the power to say what should happen? But we can't hide, we've got to address these issues. And uh, you know, asking the question, how, has, how have we fared uh, being humans with respect to human, humanity related issues? I mean, the Oxford Dictionary defines being human as a woman, a man, a woman or a child of the species Homo sapiens that distinguishes us from other animals by superior mental development, power of articulate speech and upright stance. Maybe you can question whether we have the superior power because I think sometimes animals are much more intuitive than us humans ever are. If you look at some of the things our, our compatriots do, I mean, burning in setting individuals alight in deep sloot, you know, does that make us human? Questions of this sort of nature come into based on the way we behave. So colleagues, my, my parting shot is that Humanity is a quality of being humane and benevolent. We need to be respectful for all sorts of issues, from freedom to peace to equity, dignity. We should expose principles of hope, love. We should share our knowledge. We should fight for justice. We should share the limited resources we have. We should protect the environment for the food resources that our future generations are going to be in need of. Being human is given, but keeping our humanity is definitely a matter of choice. And so with that colleagues, I, I thank you for your, your patience and your time. And let's try to live in a world where we bring science together with society and a useful policy so that we all enjoy the privilege of life and our time that we are uh, privileged to spend on this earth. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I am happy to share it and uh, uh, my colleagues will make it available should you request it. Thank you all so much for giving me this opportunity
to share my, my journey in science and to have the privilege of engaging with you. Thank you so much. Bye now. Whoa, Prof. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> I think um, I was taken aback to my university years. And I see a lot of people uh, saying a lot about how they benefited from this presentation. We have a few questions, and I think um, we will entertain them before we go away. Uh, perhaps let me take this advantage to ask my question. I have heard of what is called the mitochondrial Eve. Um, could you kindly explain what that means? Yes, yes. Yes, colleagues, the terminology, the use of the word, the term mitochondrial Eve stemmed from an article that was published soon after the Ken Stone King and Wilson article appeared in Nature. Uh, an, indivi uh, an individual from the media made reference to this because it's the convergence, convergence to a common my mother who lived at a particular time as the mitochondrial Eve. It brought into conflict um, that there was only one woman living at the time. So if you look at the different types of lineages that would have been available at that point back in the past, other women did exist, but their lineages died off or did not transmit. How will the lineage die off? Maybe that particular one, that mother only had sons. It could be possible that there was a catastrophe where a whole bunch of people died and you know, a lineage could be lost. So there are several scenarios that were presented. But what it did was bring in the biblical context of an Eve. And, and that created conflict in the literature because people sometimes would get up and swear at us that, you know, who are you to talk about Eve? You don't know anything. And, and then I would very politely say, look, this is a terminology issue that came in because a reporter coined that term. But our date of reconstructing that point to the most recent common ancestor, that's the scientific terminology, is over 150,000 years. And if you just were to consider the time differential between the biblical Eve and the most recent common ancestor, you would see there are differences in it. So I'm glad you asked it. You know, I didn't even think about bringing it up, but uh, though that's the, the way in which you distinguish between the commonly referred, and if ever I were to use mitochondrial Eve in my writing, I would put a bullet to my head because it's not right. And normally if, if you are pushed to, I would put it in inverted commas and justify why that's the case. That created a lot of confusion in the literature, but you know, media personalities like to sell stuff. So they use whatever license they have for freedom of choice. Thanks, April. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, Sandra Ayuk asks, is it possible for a child to have a genetic problem without inheriting from any of the parents? Uh, yes. There are some scenarios where, uh, and these are usually associated with what we call epigenetic transmissions, that you may, you may carry a signal somewhere, but it's not linked to a gene, and that this trait of epigeneticness is transmitted uh, through some other mechanism uh, that may affect a child. And so, so epigenetic scenarios do explain some inheritance of particular diseases. And uh, so it is possible. Wow. Another explanation could be that, and, and that is a, another tricky one, because sometimes children are adopted and disclosure about adoption is not made through. So, so the, you know, the child could have a disease that came from its biological parents, but is not present in the adopted parents. And unless they discuss it with a child, you never know. Malina Gawa asks, uh, in fact, it's a comment. Thanks for naming consent and feedback and benefits to communities. 
And Jennifer Titus asks, how should we contact the relevant people if you want to test your own genes? <laughs> Yes, now that's a very good question. So, for example, in the Department of Human Genetics at uh, Wits University and the National Health Laboratory Service, we have colleagues who are trained specialists, namely genetic counselors and medical geneticists. Uh, we have a counseling clinic. Uh, these colleagues operate at the clinic, and you can call the departments and you can look them up on the website. Uh, and if somebody on the call, uh, um, Hamida, if you know the telephone number, you could put it on the chat. Uh, call up the department and they'll schedule a visit uh, for you with one of these trained personnel, either a genetic counselor or a medical geneticist. And what they would do is, as I say, start off by asking you questions about the history of that particular trait in your family and, um, and then they will walk you through what you would need to do. If it is a test that we, uh, if it is a trait or a disease that we can offer a test for, we will do it in the department. If it is done elsewhere in the country, they will inform you accordingly, uh, collect a sample from you and your affected family members and send it to the laboratory either locally or internationally to facilitate a test. So, but we work very strongly with the trained personnel to do this sort of testing. If one wants to do genetic ancestry testing, my former department used to offer it while I was there. And a couple of years ago, uh, because of austerity measures uh, with some of the core business that we had to do, uh, the head of department decided to cancel ancestry testing. At, at the NHLS. So there are a couple of fly-by-nighters that offer it elsewhere in the world. Uh, and so uh, it is always possible to be able to trace uh, one of those on the internet and they take a cheek, send you a cheek swab, you scrape the inside lining of your cheek to collect a sample, put it in a flask, a little vial, and you ship it back to them and they will do it. Whereas my lab just did mitochondria and Y chromosome testing, some of the services elsewhere in the world will even do some of the whole genome sequence information, and they will give you predictors for diseases that you may be at risk for. So there are centers uh, in the world that does it. And I'm not so sure if the center at Cape Town still does that. I haven't checked in recent times. Thank you so much, Prof. There are quite a number of messages that say thank you very much uh, thank you. for the job well done and presentation. And Melina says, thank you. I wish I watched with my grade 12 learners. Um, well, for all of those who are asking for a recording, it will be available when it is ready, perhaps today, if not Monday, but we will put it on YouTube for everyone who wants to access it. And we will send you um, a link uh, by email. Um, Oluakemi Akinomat says, thank you so much. There are more than 22 messages. Unfortunately, I will not be able to read them all. And um, um, Tandukolo, thank you for the excellent presentation. Chantel, thank you so much. Datiso uh, Mugadi, thank you so much, Prof. Your talk was very informative. Yeah, I, uh, um, Sipo, I see there's a question about, there are so many theories to summarize why African and Europeans are different phenotypically. And I would like to address this one in the context uh, because I think it's an important question. Okay. Uh, when I said we are all Africans under the skin, I showed you a picture where all the babies looked very different. So, so how is it that our features, our phenotypes, have changed over the course of evolution. So we, we understand from several lines of information that, that humans originated in Africa. So people were dark skin. The amount of UV rays in Africa uh, differs as you go up in, long, in, in uh, the latitudes. So when early humans left Africa, 
and they went into places like Europe and later Asia, the amount of day and light differed. Uh, the intensity of the UV differed. But for us to make vitamin D, it happens in our skin and li light has to penetrate through the skin to get into the dermis where the cells are to make vitamin D. And dark skin provided a hindrance in areas where the amount of light changed. And so it was a selective pressure. And, and much more recent studies have shown this, that there are you know, a suite of genes that control pigmentation, including skin color. So lightening of skin was selected for. So individuals who left Africa through this kind of pressure to make vitamin D, because without vitamin D, people got rickets and they were severely ill. So lightening of skin came about as one of the selective advantages for early humans who left Africa. And, and they are, there's information to say that the UV light and all of this brought about this very quick transition for the selective pressure to operate for the lightening of skin. Another trait that is linked to this is hair. Why is it that I have straight hair and Africans have curly hair? In the tropics where it was intense heat, people would lose heat from their head and, you know, uh, and so on. So the curly hair pro provided like a protection so that the moisture was trapped and you didn't lose it, so it didn't become dehydrated. Why is it that Asians have the kind of squinty eyes? Because in areas where these early ancestors who left, you know, were going into snow. And you know, if those of you who have been in snow, the intensity of the sun rays that reflect out of snow make you squint. So, you know, so, so all of this kind of leads to certain adaptive traits. So essentially, Seppo, we are walking examples of the adaptations our biology and our bodies had to undergo over eons for us to successfully inhabit the changing environments in which we live. So I hope that uh, gives some explanation. There are many many gaps in it, like, you know, that I can't explain. But another trait that has been associated with the move from Africa into the Northern Hemisphere is the enlargement of noses. So in Africa, where it was warm, you know, the air was warm enough for us to breathe before it went into the lungs. But when it got into colder climate, the nose became pointed a little bit and broader to allow the contact in the surface of the nostrils to kind of warm the air a little bit before it went into the lungs. So this is what the literature suggests. And there are some you know, reasonable explanations for how it is that these phenotypic changes have come about. But as we all know, uh, across the diversity of the phenotypes of features we see in people, we still share more than 99% of our genetic information. So, you know, the limited differences bring into, into the foray of how it is we are different. So there, if, you, if you look at the genetics of any two populations across the world, none of it define what is a difference of race? For two popular, you know, you can see you can see races among lizard species and other animal species where the amount of difference between the groups needs to be in excess of fifteen percent. In humans, more than ninety-five plus percentage of the differences occur within the group rather than between the group. So that's another mm -hmm. reason why. We say that there's no biological linkage for races to be conceived as being different. We are all one race. Yes, we have some differences that bring about some of the differences in which we see ourselves, 
But if you strip the skin, our skeletons, our skin, our cardiovascular system, our nervous system, etc., you can't tell an African apart from a European or an Asian. So it's important that we understand that. Prof, thank you very much. I think more Rokhari Dipale's um, question has also been answered. Uh, Prof, would you please explain the link, how variation of individual in a population can be used to explain the timelines in terms of the evolution of species and how the degree of variation shows there was more time for mutations um, to happen? Yeah, so sometimes, and, and that's a very good question. Because in our genome, there are different rates at which different types of genetic elements mutate. So for example, short tandem repeats that are used in forensic applications, they have a much higher mutation rate than single nucleotide polymorphisms or these SNPs uh, that are referred to. So for us to be able to have more stabilizing markers, we will use the SNPs or the single nucleotide polymorphisms. So if I were to use it colloquially, if I talk about a branch, I may want to use SNPs. But if I want to get to the leaves, I may use SDRs to look at the variation within that branch. So, so implicit in trying to understand the, the genetic story, you need to be able to use you know, similar genetic markers to be able to track evolutionary scenarios. Uh, the other thing is about the mode of inheritance. So with, with an autosomal marker that we call diploid, um, so from our parental level, there are four chromosomes, two from dad, two from mom. So that's four N or four the number of chromosomes. Whereas mitochondrial DNA, it's only from one of that uh, parental line. So it is N. So diploid genes are 4N of effective population size versus N for Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. Again, when you're using the mathematical models to talk about inter-individual and inter-population differences, your models, need to take into consideration what type of DNA marker you're using, the mutation rates of the markers uh, uh, to be able to draw those kinds of comparatives. So that's that simplistic explanation. And I hope uh, it is clear that there's a degree of complexity that requires this basic understanding before you can do that. Prof, thank you very much. Um... I have so many other questions, but I think um, these questions are requesting that we should have a follow-up webinar whenever possible so that we can be able to deal with some of the questions. Uh, Susan is asking, so there are many samples out there. How are they preserved? How are they shared with other researchers? And how are they amongst... Um, um, yeah. Yeah, no, sorry, that's... That's great, Susan. So, you know, in the old days when I started in this business, we used to collect five tubes of blood because we had some people in the department who were interested in the blood cell markers. So we would use red blood cells for that. Uh, there were some people who were interested in serum protein. So we would use the clotted blood for that. And those of us interested in the DNA we're interested in the white blood cells. So when you spin blood cells down, you separate the plasma from the red cells. And at that interface are the white blood cells. Now, some of you may remember white blood cells uh, when we talk about uh, you know, infections, we have a high white blood cell count. So we would take and extract the DNA physically from there. What's involved in a DNA extraction? If you think about a balloon being like a big thing, and if you pop it, you release the air from inside. A cell is the same. Once you lyse the cell with some detergent, you release the cellular contents. But to get to the DNA is like a tequila shot. You need a part of alcohol and you need a part of salt. And so you precipitate out the DNA from that solution. 
You then resuspend this DNA and then you have it. Now, the developments from, uh, from you know, the technological era with the introduction of the polymerase chain reaction that allows you to use minuscule amounts of DNA by amplifying the targets that you want, you make many, many copies. So the PCR is like a exquisite photocopier that you make copy, 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 copy of the targets that you are interested in. So these days we do not need large amounts of DNA, but when you have the DNA, you can preserve it in a, a solution of salts and what we call a complexing agent so that the cochas don't attack it and degrade it. So, and that store, excuse me, at freezes between uh, minus 20 and minus 70 degrees Celsius. And that could be preserved for a reasonably long time. The question now becomes who has access to the use of that? Because while I may have collected my samples for population genetics, I need to go through ethics to ask if I can use it for studies on cardiovascular disease, because my subjects were informed about what I was conducting. So the question of reuse of sample becomes a much more complex issue of the informed consent that you acquired at the time in which you engage participants to join your study. You cannot just shift from saying, well, I will now shift to broad consent because publishers, funders, and ethicists would question and ask to see your informed consent forms in terms of what you requested for use. So today the debate is more around what sort of consent one collects at the time you engage in a study. And so there's a bit of a balance. Do you overkill the participants and every time you want to do a study to go to them, go to them? Or do you from the outset design your studies following the strictest of protocols known to you at the time of conducting the research to ensure that you disclose to your study subjects what it is you're planning to do? You may not even know what future use of the DNA would be. So for broad consent, you need to, to ask for that kind of permission. And I think the majority of people will give consent. We still have a lot of education to do around this on the African continent. And so elsewhere in much more of the developed world, people will donate samples for altruistic region, reasons, you know, donating for science. But because people in Africa have been exploited so much in the past for other reasons, we still need to go through these hurdles of educating and to convince study subjects of what the benefit of donating samples for research are. So I know I added another layer of information in my answer, but these two are intricately involved in terms of understanding the, the storage and the utility within the strict code of conduct of ethics for uh, the utility of samples uh, for genetic research and other sorts of purposes. Thank you very much, Prof. Can I take this opportunity? I almost put my colleague on the spot, Renata, to advertise and talk about our In Conversation webinar on the 12th of April, where Prof. Himla Sudial will be speaking to Prof. Bani Pichana. And the theme is the plight of, acad of academy and of academia and STI in the post-democratic era. So we invite you to join in as we celebrate um, our Freedom Day. So it will be on the 12th instead of the 27th. So do join us next week, Tuesday for this one if you have an interest. I almost said, please Renata speak about it, but I thought it would be very inappropriate to do so. <laughs> yes, and I would strongly recommend it. Prof. Bani Pityani is such a stalwart, so deeply seeped in the way in which our democracy has evolved from the pre-democratic era to the post-democratic era. I've heard him speak a number of times and, you know, 
I, I've been wanting to have him as my uh, in conversation with the uh, uh, colleague. Uh, so yes, come and join in because we're also going to. I'm also going to ask him issues about education. What's wrong in our education system? Barney was a former vice chancellor at UNISA. He's a theologian, uh, so he understands the complexities from multifaceted ways. And I mean, to listen to him is such a such a privilege. So if you have the time, please join us. But if you can't, once again, we publish these on Facebook. In fact, this recording is, is going live on Facebook. So, so those of you who can't wait for the recording, uh, just go as soon as uh, you are done onto the ASAF website and you'll see the recording uh, loaded onto Facebook. So thank you, Seppo, for, for sharing. Thank you, Susan, for those kind words of promotion of ASAF before. And most of all, thank you all for sitting through more than one and a half hour of your time on a cold Joburg day. And I'm told it's cold throughout the country. And it is such a privilege to be able to share with you what I consider a privileged journey. And I will continue to my last breath to promote science because you are, the, uh, are intricately involved in the selling of science, the management of science, and together we are the custodians of science to be able to see the education of our future generations be the dream we all want for our own uh, grandkids and so on. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Finally, Dade Johannes Lechabane says, uh, kindly consider natural selection and speciation uh, for the next webinar. So we are going to have an internal conversation and see if this is something we can um, do for the next webinar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Prof, thank you very much. This was the best webinar I've ever attended in the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> you are too kind. <laughs> thank you, colleagues. Have a good day going forward. Thanks, thank uh, Renata and Ina and Henriette for the backup support as well. All the best. Have a good weekend. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tim.